military strategy question. Defense chiefs testify on the Middle East before the House Armed Services Committee. Papal invitation. Pope Francis urges acceptance of his encyclical, saying it's in line with the church's social doctrine. Texans underwater. Torrential rains from a powerful storm continue pounding East Texas and now move north. And busier than ever, Coast Guard patrols intercept waves of Cuban migrants hoping to reach American soil before policies change. Those stories and more on EWTN News Nightly for Wednesday, June 17, 2015. Good evening from Washington. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Brian Patrick with your News Now. The training of Iraqi forces to fight the Islamic State is being slowed by a lack of recruits. This according to Defense Secretary Ash Carter. Today, Carter told a House committee that Iraqi government needs to be more committed to defeating ISIS. Suzanne LaFranchi has more from the White House tonight. Well, Brian, the U.S. will not meet its goal to train 24,000 Iraqi forces by this fall. Only 7,000, less than half, will be in place by then. Today, Defense Secretary Ash Carter told the House Armed Services Committee it's up to Iraq to defeat ISIS. Carter told the committee that Iraqi leaders need to empower a multi-sectarian Iraqi force to spur recruitment. He added America's goal remains the same. Stop this movement from becoming something that endangers friends and allies and therefore our interests in the region or that is capable of striking the homeland. General Martin Dempsey says the U.S. needs to be patient with the Iraqi government and that the U.S. still needs to be involved but not in a combat role. To build partners to keep pressure on the network and to make regional stakeholders who have a lot more to gain or lose than we do in the lead of it. And, and that's the path we're on. So far, the U.S. is only training local Iraqi forces, not engaging in combat. Last week, the White House announced it was sending up to 450 more U.S. troops. Those new forces will only serve as advisors. We can accelerate the recruiting, mobilization, training, and equipping of Sunni fighters, something which the Iraqi cabinet has indicated is part of their strategy. The House Armed Services Committee chairman, however, does not agree. Republican Mac Thornberry of Texas says the U.S. policy and strategy are simply inadequate at this very dangerous time. Brian. From the White House, thank you. Suzanne LaFranchi. Some of the other stories our EWTN News Nightly team has been covering in today's world. Pope Francis addresses the suffering that the death of a family member can bring. Speaking at his general audience today, he says we have a duty to console those who mourn. Francis also renewed his call to nations around the world to act on behalf of refugees. He emphasized effectively addressing the causes of forced migration. He also asked for acceptance of his new encyclical ahead of tomorrow's official release. Invito tutti ad accogliere con animo aperto questo documento. The Pope inviting everyone to accept the document with an open heart, saying it falls in line with the Church's social doctrine. Since a draft of that document was leaked on Monday, it's been hotly debated by both sides of the climate change theory. More than 400 African migrants have been rescued in two separate operations off the Libyan coast. The migrants, including some young children, arrived in a Sicilian port today. Three who tried to make the crossing reportedly died after falling from an inflatable boat. A congressional hearing takes a hard look at human rights and religious freedom violations in communist Vietnam. Jason Calvi reports. Brian, the CIA fact book says Vietnam is a country where 80% of the people don't claim a religion, about 9% are Buddhist and 7% Christian. Today I heard from those who say they're persecuted because of their faith or for writing against the government. Pastor Nguyen Man Hong leads an underground church in Vietnam. Plain clothes police came, choked me to the ground, and stepped over my body to go up and um, disband the ceremony happening upstairs. Dr. Nguyen Din Tong works with Vietnamese refugees and immigrants in the United States. He says religious practice is legal in the country, but faiths must be registered. The Vietnamese government doesn't want any group to come together because they view that as the seed of the future challenge to its authority and monopoly on power. 
Today, these Vietnamese are telling Congress about the struggles they experience in their homeland. What is the human rights situation like in Vietnam right now? Uh, it is very bleak, very dire. Human Rights Watch says bloggers and other activists face harassment, assault, and jail. According to the group, the country sentenced 29 dissidents and activists to a total of 129 years in prison last year. Nguyen Van Ha was put in jail for six years after criticizing the government. The political prisoner is totally treated, bad treated, and it's not conform with any law that being written by the government. Pastor Hung says his people will keep on fighting. As long as there are people who wish for these freedoms, I think I will continue to have the strength to uh, do what we are doing. The pastor is heading back to Vietnam at the end of the month, where it's likely because he spoke out today that he'll face trouble back home. Brian. Jason Calvi on Capitol Hill. Thank you, Jason. Flood-weary Texans deal with even more rain today, even as Tropical Storm Bill is downgraded. Now a tropical depression, Bill could produce another four to five inches of rain for central Texas. People there, of course, are still trying to recover from Memorial Day weekend floods that left 14 dead. As far north as Missouri, a man died when his car was swept off the road by rising water. The prison worker charged with helping two convicted murderers escaped talked with them about killing her husband. Prosecutors say prison tailor Joyce Mitchell agreed to be the getaway driver for the escapees. They say she later backed out because she still loved her husband and felt guilty. Mitchell is charged with supplying contraband to the two inmates. Meanwhile, New York State Police say they're meticulously following all leads, hoping to recapture those convicts. The complexity of this investigation cannot be described, but I can assure everybody here and everyone who's listening or reading these reports, that every lead is being followed up on to its conclusion, no matter where that lead is. The search area has been expanded beyond a 16 square mile area of woods and fields where the manhunt has been most intense until now. A North Carolina elementary school teacher and an assistant principal at that school resigned. This after a controversial book was read to third grade students. Catherine Zeltner is here with that story now. Brian, third grade teacher Omar Curry heard that one of his students was getting bullied, being called gay in Jen. Instead of following the school's bullying policy, Curry, an openly gay man, decided to read the book King and King to his class in April. The book is a story about a prince who falls in love with another prince. It ends with a happily ever after royal wedding. Within hours, outraged parents started calling the school. Parents of three children filed written complaints to a school review committee. I spoke with one of those parents who has two kids in the school. I was shocked and I was upset because I felt like the material was not age appropriate. I felt like the material for some families would be controversial and that it's not the age to talk about those topics with children especially having not discussed it with parents and families first. For the third time, concerned parents will meet with the school review committee tomorrow. They'll call on them to ban King and King. The committee has twice before upheld the use of the book. The Orange County School Board tells EWTN that Curry and the assistant principal who lent him King and King were not fired. They resigned voluntarily. Now teachers at the school must submit an advanced list to parents of all the books they intend to read with students. Brian. Catherine Seltner, thank you. We are seeing a rise in the number of babies being born in the U.S. A Centers for Disease Control report shows births are up after a seven-year decline. Roughly 53,000 more babies were born in 2014 than during 2013. That increase spans all racial and ethnic groups. At the same time, teen births hit historic lows also, C-sections and preterm births are down. The U.S. birth rate is still slightly below the level experts say is needed for a stable population. Coming up, a teen describes a shark attack off the Carolina coast that cost him his arm. And thousands of Cuban migrants tried desperately to reach American soil before policies change. On the 17th of June, the church honors St. Albert Chemowski, who died in 1916.
He gave up wealth and a promising career as an artist to work with the homeless. Thanks for joining us on this Wednesday evening. I'm Brian Patrick. The U.S.-Cuba relationship may be changing, but the U.S. Coast Guard continues to intercept thousands of Cuban migrants. They risk their lives in the open seas, hoping to take advantage of a controversial Cold War era policy. Just off the Florida Keys, these Cuban migrants are transferred from one Coast Guard cutter to another. They're searched and dressed in jumpsuits they will wear until they're sent back home. Migrants often use flimsy rafts to make the dangerous sail 90 miles across the Florida Straits. This is the, uh, the wild west of the Coast Guard. Uh, we've got drugs, uh, we've got migrants, and we've got search and rescue. Over the years, Cubans have adapted to U.S. patrols by traveling to Mexico, then overland, or finding new sea routes to Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. While U.S. policy toward Cuba may be changing, if anything, the Coast Guard's mission is now even more difficult. I think it's going to get probably a little worse before it gets better. U.S. authorities turned back nearly 4,000 migrants last year. That number is expected to climb this year because fears that the U.S. will end its controversial wet foot, dry foot policy. That policy allows Cubans who touch U.S. soil to stay. But analysts and many Cuban Americans say the Cold War era special privilege has outlived its purpose. Most people agree that it has to be reviewed review to avoid abuses that are taking place right now. Some who patrol these waters struggle with their duties. It can be disheartening to see case after case after case or repeat offender after repeat offender. Sometimes children are among those living on deck where they get medical attention and some decent food. So much of your time spent on board is morale driven and a lot of morale is derived from food. The Coast Guard estimates the interdiction, much of it aimed at Cubans, has cost more than $3 billion in the past five years. And there's is some encouraging news tonight about the teen who survived a shark attack off North Carolina's coast. Actually, two of them. The family of a 13-year-old victim expects that she will be able to keep her leg. A 16-year-old who lost his arm is now talking about what happened and Wyatt Goolsby reports. One of the victims of that brutal pair of shark attacks off the coast of North Carolina speaking out for the first time from his hospital bed, 16-year-old Hunter Treshel recounting that traumatic shark encounter that cost him his arm. I was just in about waist deep water, I would say, playing with my cousin, like I said, and I felt this kind of hit on my left leg, like it felt like I, like normal, like there's a big fish coming near you or something. That was the first I saw it was when it was biting up my, my left arm. The teen from Colorado was swimming in the waters off Oak Island when the shark attacked. I didn't see it coming, uh, but I felt it on my leg. Um, and then I saw it once it had attacked my arm. This happening a mere 90 minutes after another shark attack unfolded on the same beach less than two miles away, where 13-year-old Kirsten Yao had her left arm torn off by a shark, bystanders leaping into action to prevent the victims from bleeding to death. The kid just got his arm bit off. Okay, are you with the person now? My husband is. He's got it wrapped up in a towel as tight as he can. Just two days after that life-changing attack, Hunter vows to remain positive. I have kind of two options. I can try to uh, live my life the way I was and make an effort to do that even though I don't have an arm, or I can kind of just let this be completely debilitating and bring my life down and ruin it in a way. Out of those two, there's really only one that I would actually choose to do, and that's to try to fight and live a normal life with the cards I've been dealt. The beach is still open for business. Officials are warning residents to swim at their own risk. Wyatt Goolsby, EWTN News Nightly. God bless that courageous young man. Well, family and marriage are at the center of the Holy Father's trip to the United States this September. Today, couples seeking a happy, holy union face many challenges. Art and Lorraine Bennett are co-editors of Catholic and Married, Leaning into Love. It's published by our Sunday Visitor. So this is a book I know a lot of our viewers want to read. What are some of the challenges of marriage that are addressed in this? Well, Brian, uh, there's many challenges actually facing uh, couples today, especially young couples, who many of whom have parents who are divorced 
and um, they're wondering, you know, am I going to be able to make it at, in, in marriage? You know, so they're kind of like putting it off or postponing marriage or not getting married at all. And some of them are wondering whether cohabitation is the thing to do. And in this book, we talk, or the authors of all the different um, chapters talk about all these various things, like being a child of divorce, cohabitation, contraception, um, the what is it like to marry young right out of college? So so today's culture really is making it more difficult to be married, isn't it? I think it is, Brian. Uh, you know, there's two kind of pillars of, of, of Catholic families, a uh, Christian point of view. One is that it's unitive, and I think the, uh, marriage is no longer seen as united with Christ or a product of, of, of God. It's harder for couples to get together, so unitive is kind of under attack. And then the, the uh, having children is also under attack, not just abortion and contraception, but just kind of the lifestyle we lead. Kids are too expensive and it's difficult. So I think those are two core areas of, of, of family life that are being attacked today. Yeah, marriage is tough, and unless it's a strong marriage, it really could run into trouble. How can couples strengthen their own marriage, and how can we support married couples? Well, we, in our chapter, we do address, we're the old married couple of the, <laughs> of this book. Mature. But, yes, Mature, yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, um, yeah, we talk about um, three pillars of, the, of a healthy marriage, and it, we, we think that it's communication, forgiveness, and then, the, most importantly, having the foundation in Christ, you know, the, the grace from the sacrament of marriage and the grace of ongoing participation in the sacraments. That is so key because couples think they're going to cohabitate to figure out mm -hmm. whether or not they actually get along. And, and when they do that, they don't have the grace of the sacrament mm -hmm. to right. strengthen them. Mm -hmm. That's right. So Sunday is Father's Day. Let's talk a little bit about how we can support men in the role that they play in the family and in the marriage. Mm -hmm. Well, I think men, men need to feel respected. Uh, men want to be loved, and, and that's really important. But if I think if a man feels respected, it doesn't mean you agree with everything that the, the, the husband's doing. That's vitally important. I think another key role that, that wives can play to help husbands is wives tend to be a little more, more social, a little bit more involved. So sometimes they can prod, and Lorraine's done this with me, to, we should need to talk to our oldest son, or why don't, you, why don't you come home a little earlier, make sure you make that ball game. So I think encouraging the interaction that is maybe not as natural for men helps us to be better fathers. How do you take that prodding, Art? I don't always like it. <laughs> you don't yeah, call it nagging, though. I noticed that. <laughs> I don't. I've learned not to nag. <laughs> Prodding and nagging, I'm sure, are very different things, aren't well, they? Uh, Lorraine does it in a very yeah. diplomatic way, but I, I think women have a natural sense of the, of the community aspect of families, and sometimes we men were compartmentalizing, so it encourages us to be more involved. I think is a great gift. It is family. key for the for the dad, the husband, to be in the middle of the mm -hmm. family, isn't it? That's, That's right. absolutely right. Yeah. Well, happy Father's Day to all the dads, Catholic and married, leaning into love from our Sunday visitor. You can find it at osv.com. Uh, we appreciate both of you being with us today. Thanks. The Bennetts, thanks so much. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. And Palestinian Muslims prepare for their holy month of Ramadan, which starts tomorrow. Lights decorate a town square in the West Bank as people stock up on supplies. Muslims observe Ramadan by fasting from sunrise to sundown in these long days of summer. It is seen as a way to physically and spiritually detoxify through self-restraint. That fast is broken with a nightly feast. Up next, ahead of Father's Day, Dr. Jem Sullivan guides us through sacred art depicting St. Joseph and fatherhood. And after a 40-year drought, the Golden State Warriors take the NBA crown. The Beauty of Faith is Dr. Jem Sullivan's book. She is the former National Gallery of Art guide and uh, the author of our Beauty of Faith segment. We're looking at pieces with fatherly themes, both of them focused on St. Joseph. You know I love St. Joseph. Joseph did not speak in Scripture. We have no recorded words, but we do know he listened, and isn't that what our first piece is about? Exactly. St. Joseph listening to the Angel's Council by Sebastian Bourdon is an exquisite etching from the National Gallery of Art. We see Jesus, Mary, and Joseph as they prepare to flee to Egypt. We know from Matthew's Gospel that Herod was trying to kill the Christ child. Herod saw Jesus as a threat to his brief and pitiful power. And so you feel the anguish of this family in this moment of danger. At the same time, we see St. Joseph, his face full of calm and strength as he listens, listens to the angel who's tugging on his cloak and mm. pointing in the direction that they should travel. 
St. Joseph was the man chosen by God to be the foster father of Jesus. He was the protector of Jesus and Mary. What a great, great privilege. And yet Joseph knew that he had to rely on the grace of God to fulfill his role. So as we celebrate Father's Day, we pray for the intercession of St. Joseph on all fathers uh, through St. Joseph, who's patron of fathers, uh, for his wisdom, his strength uh, of fatherhood. I'm in the business of talking, and I know I need to do more listening. And I pray to St. Joseph all the time for that ability to really listen. And then he's also a man of action. In fact, Matthew tells us that he got up immediately and took Mary and the child to safety in Egypt. That's what really our next uh, portrait is about. That's correct. The rest on the flight into Egypt by Vittore Carpaccio is another beautiful masterpiece painting from the National Gallery of Art. Here we see Jesus and Mary traveling down this winding, dusty road, uh, seated on a donkey, and St. Joseph leading them on the way. Now, if St. Joseph takes one more step, he walks right off the painting. Uh, <laughs> there's a sense in it's which you feel... The road there. That's right. You, there's a sense in which you feel his strength, his, his gentle care for this family. And the Gospels don't give us many details about him, but what we do know is that St. Joseph was a man of deep faith and trust in God. St. Joseph was the guardian of the Redeemer, as St. John Paul II said. He's the patron of fathers, the patron of workers, and the patron of the Universal Church. So as we remember our fathers, both living and deceased, uh, during, on Father's Day, uh, we entrust them to St. Joseph, that he will guide them on the path to faith in Jesus, the Redeemer, who St. Joseph loved with such fatherly care. I find it a little amusing, though, that that looks like a walk in the park, when I really believe that the trek to Egypt through the desert was probably pretty tough. That's right, and that's why as protector and guardian of the Redeemer, St. Joseph had such an important role, and we see that so beautifully depicted in these masterpiece paintings. Well, I know on his inaugural sermon, uh, Pope Francis was inaugurated on the Feast of St. Joseph in 2013, and he talked about St. Joseph being the protector, but also a kind, gentle spirit. Do you see him that way in these paintings? Absolutely. Both artists, each in their own very different ways, are showing us that Joseph was a gentle man, a man of great deep strength, but his strength came from his faith in God. This is a regular series we're doing about the beauty of faith. You've spent many years guiding people through these beautiful works of art. What have you learned about your faith from that experience? I think what I've learned is that faith is, leads us into the beauty of our experience of God that we know that through these beautiful paintings, somehow something of the transcendent mystery of God is revealed through them. The Beauty of Faith. Where can we get a copy of your book? It's actually on Amazon. All right. Dr. Jem Sullivan, we always appreciate having you here, and we'll look forward to having you back. Thank you so much. Well, the Golden State Warriors knock out the Cleveland Cavaliers to win their first NBA championship in 40 years. It makes it so much, so much more special to have gone through some, some down years and injuries and <clears throat> transition from a roster standpoint and uh, to be able to sit here six years later from a rookie year and, and hold this trophy. This is an unbelievable experience. Because of key injuries for the Cleveland Cavaliers, star player LeBron James had to carry the team during the playoff run. King James was still confident after Game 5 that the Cavs would be victorious, saying he is the best player in the world. Well, he had a bit of a different tone after last night's defeat. You got to be healthy. You got to be healthy. You got to be playing great at the right time. You got to have a little luck. And uh, we, we were playing great, but we had no luck and we weren't healthy. Maybe no luck and you weren't healthy, but you had a great hat. This is LeBron's fourth loss in six NBA Finals. In Oakland, California, they'll have a parade and a rally for the Warriors on Friday. Well, until tomorrow, for the EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Brian Patrick as we leave you this with these moments captured in pictures at the Pope's general audience today at St. Peter's Square. Good night and God bless you.